We're continuing on in our discussion of the second major event in the primeval period, which is the fall. The record of the fall uh, extends from chapter 3 to chapter 5. Chapter 3 describes the entrance of sin into the world. This is the chapter that we normally associate with the fall. Chapters 4 and 5, however, can also be associated with the fall in the sense that it describes the extension of sin to the human race. The entrance of sin, chapter 3, the extension of sin, chapters 4 and 5. And those two chapters show us just how bad sin was and who it affected. In our last class, we only got as far as an introduction of, as to the source of sin in chapter verse 1. The temptation to sin in verses 1 through the first part of verse 6 Which? The source? Yeah. One is the source. Yeah, you, you should have notes on that. Um, we were discussing uh, the serpent indwelt and empowered on this occasion by Satan. Uh, the, uh, the temptation that Adam and Eve received is external. The source was outside of them. Remember we're talking about that? Sure do. But the source of our temptation is both external and internal. James says that we are drawn away of our own lust. Totally well, probably what you did is you just put all that under introduction. Because uh, I was talking about introductory remarks. He entered the center of the universe and the fall of Satan and all that. So some of that stuff about, particularly the James 1 reference, is kind of an important comparison for that source of sin. In this case, what... In order for sin to come into the world, it came from outside of the man and the woman. Okay. Now, the temptation itself. Uh, there are several scriptures that I'll give to you right now, before I forget, that describe Satan's devices in tempting men. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3 says... I fear lest by any means, just as the serpent beguiled Eve through his craftiness, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And he describes in verse 4 the nature of the, of the serpent's craftiness. This is remarkable. Paul says today, this is how the this is how the devil tricks people today. He preaches another Jesus. He preaches, uh, he, he gives another spirit, and he preaches another gospel. In other words, he uses God's terminology and redefines it. He just changes it, didn't he? Didn't he? Here's another object lesson for you. You ought, you ought to make a little note. <laughs> you ought to keep a page for object lessons. Hey, wow. There's only a slight difference chemically between... Uh, uh, oh, what was it? Um, sugar and some kinds of poison. Salt. So it's Is it salt? You know, it makes it the right way you have poison. Yeah. Chloride. There are certain that you could come up, you could you could uh, mix two solutions of of stuff and drink one, and then feed one to a volunteer. Steve, <laughs> <laughs> hey, please come here. <laughs> you know, I'm, sure, I'm not going to use that uh, object lesson, sir. <laughs> two minutes, uh, the hair falls out or something. I only drop dead. Things work. <laughs> okay, so you can't go by looks or terminology. You have to go by the meaning. In the context, see. And Second Corinthians chapter eleven, verse three and four is Paul's. You know, he, he actually says, "Look, this is the way the devil does it. He's tricking. Okay. He 
describes his trickiness. Another passage is, well, actually, that whole chapter, down to verse 14, Satan has his own angels of light, ministers of righteousness, verse 15. Verse 13, they transform themselves into the apostles of Christ. They look like creatures, but they're really satanic emissaries. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, Paul says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. How does Satan work? Not a, every, every new disciple ought to have a lesson on the devices of Satan. How does Satan work? That would be a tremendous message to preach today. What are you doing next Sunday night, man? Looking for a preacher on next Sunday night. What? Why don't you preach on the devices of Satan? He uses Bible terminology and changes the meaning. He uses good-looking preachers with great charisma and personality. <laughs> um, we, can, we can develop it for you. Right? I'm going to be gone, so if you want to preach, you're really going to have to volunteer. Um, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. Do not love the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, there you go, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And those three things are evident in the arsenal of the devil when he tempted Eve back in the Garden of Eden. I want you to know that the first temptation essentially was just a conversation. This is the first conversation recorded in the Bible. Words have power. Words are not innocuous. They're not necessarily meaningless. Even meaningless words are used to confuse and, right? And to, I mean, teachers do this regularly when they make up questions on tests. They'll throw in on a true and false question, a whole statement, a whole bunch of um, smokescreen words. <laughs> so you have to be able to filter through those words to get at what he's actually saying. Is it true or is it false? This is part of life, part of discerning. See? Now, when we look at this first conversation, we find that it was a matter of words. Ideas and philosophies come from words. And that's why, by the way, just to point like an application here. Um, in, exposi in exposition, you always do try to make application. Um, what we see in the first six verses of Genesis chapter 3 is the first misuse of words. The first misuse of words in the Bible. And the same thing is still going on today. We're warned as Christians in Colossians chapter 2. For example, there are many examples, but I'll read this one. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 4, Paul says, Beware, this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Verse 8, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy, vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, not after Christ. So the world uses words. Verse 23, describing the doctrines of men, he says, these things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body. Paul warned Timothy in uh, 1 Timothy, the end of the book. Timothy, 
Timothy, keep that which is committed to your trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of knowledge falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. 1 Timothy 6.20 So words are at stake. They're the, they're the medium of uh, temptation. Okay, in this conversation we basically have Satan speaking twice and the woman speaking once. Chapter 3, verse 1. Let's look at this temptation. It began with a question. This is the first question in the Bible. Isn't it interesting that the first question in the Bible was actually satanic in origin? It was really intended to deceive. Questions can be either legitimate or illegitimate. I was preaching once, and uh, a man who once came to this church and who was at that point still in the church and yet disgruntled stood up while I was preaching and asked me a question. It was a loaded question. It was intended to uh, make me falter and contradict and, and to, to divide the leadership in the church. That was what it, the question was intended to do. It wasn't a legitimate question. It sounded legitimate on the outside, but everybody that had been there for a few weeks was well aware of what was really being said. So, uh, that's the sort of question that was in here. The, one, the first question was, has God said? It was questioning God's word, the basic authority. Very significant. Did God really say that? By raising this question, Satan raised doubt. He twisted God's words. He appealed to human reason. And you know, ever since then, it has still been the same. Sin always comes from from people operating in the realm of rationalism as opposed to revelation. If you follow what the Word says, you won't sin. If you follow what your mind says, you'll sin. It's right here. Yea, has God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Did God tell them that, he could, that they couldn't eat of every tree of the garden? Well, hardly. See, by, by partially quoting God's words, by providing, man, this is so important, there's a tremendous principle here. Every cult today, every Christian cult uses words from the Bible out of context. You can prove anything you want, just about, from Satan's yeah, scripture. Okay? Um, Jehovah's Witnesses love to take that verse in the Gospels where Jesus said uh, the Son of Man does not know the times of the season. And, and on that basis they, uh, they, they argue well, Christ couldn't have been omniscient then. Therefore he couldn't have been God. Because God obviously is omniscient. See that's the line of reason. That's the line of uh, they just, that's the sort of approach and this is exactly from the very beginning Satan's first word for a question in which he missed he took God's words out of context he, he, it was a veiled threat to the authority the final authority of God's word it introduced the possibility of human reason as being more useful than God's word. Uh, 
Now moving to verses 2 and 3, that's a good illustration. Verses 2 and 3, we have uh, Eve's response, the woman's response. What we have here is the first rationalization in the Bible. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, and this is her perverted quotation, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. What was wrong with the statement? She added, she added to God's word. She wasn't actually clear of what God had said. What did she add? Yeah, God didn't say you couldn't touch it. He just, you yeah, want to go back to it. Um, Genesis 2, 16 and 17. God commanded the man of every tree of the garden, thou mayest freely eat. That's the part that Satan quoted. Okay? But then God went on to say, but, the limitation, the crucial part, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. Very. There's a number of touching. Of course, if you're going to eat it, you have to touch it, right? Unless you jump up and take a bite. Maybe an asshole it. I'll let you and don't you dare touch it. <laughs> um, well, that raises a kind of an interesting scenario or issue. Uh, to whom did God give those original words? Adam. If Genesis chapter 2 is chronological, and we haven't taken it that way, either if it's not chronological, it's quite plausible that Eve hadn't yet been created on the sixth day when God gave to Adam that responsibility. Some people have suggested that since God spoke to this to Adam, it actually says that, it says he commanded the man, that it was therefore Adam's duty to command the woman, and that Obviously, from Genesis chapter 3, when Eve seems to add to it, it's either, number one, that Adam inaccurately conveyed the message, or that Eve inaccurately perceived the message. Right? I mean, in, in communication, the, the only thing that can go wrong is the teller can say it wrong, or the listener can hear it wrong. But Adam, you might have been just running as a and just you know, advertising. Mm -hmm. Well, that's speculative theology. We don't know exactly why she said what she said. We're speculating as to the reason. But it's very clear, at any rate, that Eve is thinking and saying something that God hadn't said. Right? Now, rationalism does this. Have you ever rationalized something from the Word of God? What was the last issue that you had to deal with in your own life? You must have rationalized it. Everybody rationalizes. Even if you make the right decision, you always rationalize through it. <laughs> you can't think of an example off the top of your head. Yeah, I can. I think you can. I hear a lot about the church and I see things in the spirit. It bothers me because I, believe it or not, I am very sensitive to a lot of things. And I find it more inside. Like when I'm praying and stuff or reading this word, my heart can cry. It's more on that. Maybe I'll do stuff and show it sometimes. But, and I have to realize that, well, this is how the Lord is working with me. If other people are able to show it out, then it's fine. But I'm doing this on the basis of God's word. That's how it affects me. And it's his word that will convict me and will speak to me. Nothing else. He is my judge, my comfort, my guide, my chastiser. But he is willing. And that's not what I want to make him or what I want to feel he is. But so, I can easily rationalize I want to feel like this. Okay, another 
another uh, good example is that condition that Christ gave for discipleship in one of the Gospels. It says, you can't be my disciple unless you leave your father and your mother and your wife and your children and forsake all and follow me. <laughs> um, no, you know, lots of people rationalize that. You know, he surely doesn't expect us to separate. Well, your ministry and your work makes all you to do so. That's right. That's the things you do. Right. Also, the Lord gave you an understanding. So when you're looking for a wife, if you plan on serving the Lord, you better lay that right in front, because I did. This is a good thing. I went to the right because she could very really adopt her because uh, she had a few inches of her food stick pick and she didn't want to fix her if she was in business. I was telling her, oh, too bad. You need to do anything as a Christian. You don't going to be on soon or So rationalizing is, uh, had, had Eve sinned here? Had she concretely disobeyed God's word? Had she eaten yet? No. This was still the temptation part. Is it sin to be tempted? No. But boy, this is sure setting the groundwork. It's an illustration that you never concretely disobey God without mentally going through a downhill slide. Even if it's an unconscious one. I'm not sure. Well, the Bible says that Eve didn't realize that she was making a mistake. She was tricked. She was actually deceived. She thought there was nothing wrong with doing what she did. First Timothy chapter 2 says that the woman was deceived in the transgression. She was deceived. Uh, all right, so that's the nature of... Uh, she had uh, evidently been told God's word by Adam, and her fatal weakness was that she was unclear. Right. Now, Satan's uh, last words to Eve in the temptation prior to her sin are found in verses 4 and 5. Here we have the first denial in the Bible. The first denial. In verse 1, we have the first question. In verses 2 and 3, we have the first rationalization. Verses 4 and 5, we have the first denial. Basically, Eve denied, or Satan denied what God said. First, he raised a doubt against it. He inferred that God, are you sure that this is what God said? And when he gets, when he's successful to that degree, the next step is to outright contradict it. That's what he did. The serpent said to the woman, you will not die. Hey, you're not, there's no way you're going to die. What had God said? 2.17 In the day you eat, thou shalt surely die. Now, this is an overt contradiction. First he raises doubts. And if he succeeds in drawing you that far, then he's got you where he wants you and he will deny God's word. Um, to this denial, he adds a rationalization. Satanic rationalization, rationalization is, I would tend to say almost always, always partly true. There's always an element of truth. That's what makes it successful. His philosophical support for his denial is God knows that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and you shall be as God, knowing good and evil. Was Satan wrong on that, on that point? Were the, did, did he say... Uh, Like, there's two or three things involved here. Was he wrong in saying that God knew what, that God was omniscient? Was, was he? Do you think that God didn't know what would happen to Adam and Eve? God knew. Satan was right on that point. 
uh, about the timing in the day that you eat thereof. Did Satan agree with that? It was his statement there correct? In the day that you eat thereof? Yeah, God said that in the day that you eat thereof, yeah. 2.17, you shall surely die. Yeah, but Satan, interpretation that they did die spiritually. That's it. Yeah, and Satan was trying to convince the woman that what he was saying was true. And he, he even mimicked God's word. In the day that you... Uh, God knows that when you eat in that very day, so he the the um, the omniscience of God and the timing of God, you know, he had it all down. He's part of it. Thou shalt surely die, did they? They died spiritually. Um, what was wrong then? What's wrong with the statement? Verse 5. Or is it? Eh? Well, look at verse 7. Okay, so everything that Satan has said on the face of it, you know, like if you analyze each particular statement, by itself the statement is not wrong. What is wrong with verse 5? This is Satan's rationalization. Put it in context. What, is, what really is Satan saying? In context, yeah. He shall not surely die. Then he goes on to make his own statement. It would be like God. He, made, he gave them a, he denied what God said, and then he gave them a higher hope. He just wasn't telling the bad thing. He did. It was a smoke screen. Yeah. He just started blabbing. Basically, what he had done was he had said something very bold. He had said, You will not die. He had completely contradicted God's word. And then as if to mollify the thinking or the objections that might be raised in each, she might start to get an inkling of something here. Mm -hmm. Like, that's shocking. You will not surely die. That's, a, that's outright different. And so as a smoke screen, everything else he says is right on. It's a smoke screen. Looks like he did it on part of it and then had it No, I think that that's the way Satan operates. He'll come out and he'll get you to swallow a false premise. And then he'll make it look good with a whole bunch of truth. There's something else that you don't see quite as easily from this. But I believe that what he was... That his surface statements are right, but it infers something about God. It almost makes God look like he's jealous of man. Like that he doesn't want man to know. He wants man to remain ignorant. It makes him look makes God look like an arbitrary despot sitting up in heaven playing with people. And Satan is going, hey, psst, you know. The implication, if I, if I was going to paraphrase it, I'd say that Satan said this. Eve, you're not going to die. Really, you know, God is sitting up there in heaven. He's jealous. He's afraid of you. He doesn't want you to know anything. That's the inference that I get from reading this. Do you get that? I have a question. I don't think it's my fault. Satan, I want you to know that stuff. Satan was thinking that Eve would die in the first Man was given to him to do what? But I mean, it's not, it's not just that he, that he didn't leave long enough alone. He knew he was being. He must have been the mission he was in. He started resisting it, doubting God even more. God, God must have given him permission to do it. 
can't see it being otherwise. No. Same as we say before, Joe, if I get that image, I don't want to create it. There's your survey little green test feeder that we said to use. That'll make the phone realize the same. Sure, I think that uh, Satan is jealous of man's uh, original relationship to God, created fellowship. It's like anything else. Uh, uh, people that are wrong don't like people that are right because it makes them look bad. You know, that's the situation. Satan is the one that has sinned. And man hasn't sinned, and so man therefore became Satan's enemy too. Right? Anyway, I just want you to see that Satan's last statement in verses 4 and 5 is, is a combination of error and truth. The error was blatant denial, and then there was a lot of surface truth there, but even the surface truth was twisted. You know, it left a false impression. It could have. I think that he was basically appealing to the human ego and challenging uh, the woman to become independent like God. He was appealing to her uh, pride of life, her flesh. So the act of sin then in verse 6, simple little words, Um, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, there's the lust of the eyes, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, pride of life. Well, actually, you have the lust of the flesh, good for food, for the body, and then the lust of the eyes, pleasant to the eyes. It would be beneficial, it would look nice. Hey, you're making wise. That's a part of life. When she succumbed to that threefold temptation, then she took of the fruit and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her, did eat. This is the first mistake in the Bible. In the Greek, there are a number of different words to describe it. Um, I'd like to write it down for you. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14 describes Eve's work, Eve's sin as um, parabasis, or parabasis. I don't know where the accent goes in this particular word. But this means a going aside. And overstepping. This word is used in Romans 5.14 of Adam too. And Romans 5 15 to 18 you have the word Paraptoma used for the sin of Adam, which means a false step. A trespass. A blunder. Uh, Romans 5.19 describes this sin as a Parakae. Wherefore, as by the disobedience, that is, refusal to hear. Have you taken the verb akuo yet? Look at it, see? Akae and para 
Uh, besides what you hear, it's, it leaves the impression of some refusal to hear, to listen. In Romans 5, 20 and 21, key passage is Romans 5. It refers to Adam's sin as uh, hamartia. Hamartia. Missing, missing the mark. Look, once again, uh, object lessons. Take your, take your bow to Sunday school and shoot an arrow and miss the bullseye. Okay? That's, that's an illustration. <laughs> Yeah, my <laughs> or another illustration, um, you know, act of a skit where somebody refuses to listen to somebody talk to them, right? Or um, these two words could be used to illustrate, uh, you know, make somebody uh, walk a line with uh, looking through uh, binoculars upside down. <laughs> Satan provided the binoculars. He skewed their vision, right? He deceived Eve, and because she couldn't, wasn't looking at it right, she stepped off the path. Right? It's an illustration of her sin. Stepping off the path, missing the mark, not listening carefully. All of those words are used to describe the sin of Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. That's what is the one used in the first sin? Most of Shooting with the bow and he misses the target more than David. <laughs> Sin. Not right, Yankee. That's the one I was always told about. Um, that word par parabasis is uh, going aside. It's a legal term. It always means going aside from the law, breaking the law. What's the retreat? Repent. Repent is to turn about No, repent means to have a change of mind. To be converted means to have a change of direction. To be turned epistrephal. Okay? So Romans chapter 5, verses 14 to 21 describes Adam's sin of a number of different ways. Is that last one fair point? Paracoa. I'm not sure. I I didn't learn the accents on those nouns. Now, in our next class, we'll discuss the results of the sin. Okay? We made some progress today. I think we're over time. By half an hour. This will be a good course, anyway. No, no, now. Uh, is it set up the way it was planned?